Oh, hello. Uh, this is a Humble Collector, and we are doing a tour of the collection room now that it's been set up. Uh, the last time that we showed this was during the live stream where we were kind of getting things unboxed, put on shelves. Admittedly, I haven't organized too, too much since then. This would be a good time to actually, like, you know, highlight a couple artifacts, look at some things. And, yeah, just overall have a good time while we wait for our lunch to cook at this <laughs> point. Uh, of course, I'm enjoying my stereoscope. Just, just what you naturally do. Oh, yeah, yeah, you just, you know. We, we, you don't own a TV or, or a computer or anything? I don't even know what a computer is. Don't look over there. Um, I can't remember if I talked about any of the yard longs, but this is one that I still need to get framed. That is the No Man's Land in France, uh, northern France to be specific. You picked that up at Max last year. I correct? did, yeah. I picked that up at Max. Um, yard longs are really fun because they're these really cool large format photos, and... They tend to go for about 100 bucks a piece. That seems to be the going rate, unless there's something really crazy about them. The problem is they take up so much wall space. <laughs> As you can see here, this is just, there's six yard bombs on that wall, and it's already, like, basically full. Um, yeah. You say you're going to open a yard-long museum, but let's be honest, you'll just have multiple museums. So there will be a featured <laughs> exhibit of yard-longs oh, yeah. in the museum. Oh, yeah, it'll be like a temporary exhibit. I'll have to rent out one of the derelict buildings down in town and... Open up on the weekends. That'd be fun. <laughs> uh, but yeah, pretty cool stuff. We have a... Um, this is from Camp Jackson, South Carolina. This is some kind of, uh, I believe, repair company for like the trucks, which is pretty neat. Um, and we have a uh, tank company here armed with uh, Renault FT-17 tanks, um, which is pretty neat. Most of the tankmen during World War One for the U.S. were actually trained in France. Um, so th there was... A push for the U.S. to produce their own tanks domestically, but by the time those lines actually like got up and running, the war was over. So basically, all the U.S. tank forces in France were equipped with French and British built tanks. Yeah, I think uh, that's the story with Camp Colt in Gettysburg. Like they got was it 1917, like middle or early 1918, it was set up. Yeah. And by the time that they all been trained and got their, you know, got serviced in, the war was over. Yeah, pretty much. That that happened with like a lot of this late war equipment. Is a lot of it. <laughs> was made in France and England because they were already tooled up by the time we got around to it. It was, yeah, it's kind of already over. Um, this one's pretty cool. It's a local piece. This is the um, uh, dedication of the Mount Lebanon honor roll in October of uh, 1919. So Mount Lebanon, that's a, uh, what, a borough of Pittsburgh? or Yeah. It's a neighborhood. Yeah, neighborhood of Pittsburgh. There, there, there's really no beginning or end to these neighborhoods of Pittsburgh. They, they all, all kind of just blend together. Yeah. Yeah. But, um... It's one of the more affluent ones, I think, in town. But yeah, pretty cool having the dedication there. I picked that up at a local antique store. Um, here we have Company D, 509th Engineers, Camp Gordon, Atlanta. Um, now this one's just like a uh, bird's eye view of a town in Germany. So that one might actually not be military related because one of the things that I found out as I did more research into yard longs is they aren't just a military thing. Those seem to be the ones that I always find, but they were created for a variety of topics. Um, and then in the back here... This set was actually gifted to me by Readout, also from a local antique store. Oh, we yeah. Have some nice cavalry shots here, some wagons and stuff. Um, you know, a lot of people, it, it's funny because one of the big comparison points I think people make from World War One and World War Two is the modernization and mechanization of armies that happened yeah. in the interwar period. Not everybody was running around with machine gun folks. In fact, machine guns were more the exception, not the norm for most of the conflict. Yeah. Um, but also, you know, we, we think about World War II, we don't think about horses a lot, but the German military relied heavily on horse-drawn logistics for a good chunk of the war. Now, of course, you don't see that in the propaganda reels that get played in all the, uh, you know, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's like a movie, but it's educational. It's called a documentary. It's a documentary. Wow. We can't English. It's okay. We, yeah. We've both been not able to English this weekend. Yeah, pretty pretty much. But yeah, all the documentaries when they show like footage of like the German like Operation Barbarossa, for example, it's always like the Panzers and you know all of this mechanized warfare. But re in reality, like the German logistics were horse drawn for most of the war. But that doesn't look good on film when you're doing propaganda, so that's why you don't really see it very often. So I got to ask the obvious question: uh, moving into a new room, moving your collection to a new room. Uh, what are the advantages slash disadvantages of being in this space now? Yeah, so one of the nice things about being in this space is significantly larger in the old collection room, and also the back when I was living in my parents' house, 
Um, that room was not just, like, my collection room. That was also, like, where I had in my couch and TV when I wanted to, like, watch or do stuff. So it was really, like, half a room that I had for the collection. And now I've got all this space I can spread out. Um, so one of the big things when I moved in here that I wanted to do was I wanted to have two separate shelves for World War I and World War II. Uh, if you'll remember before, I just had this shelf and it, everything was on it. And it was just super crowded, really hard to, like, see or appreciate anything. Um, so I really wanted to spread all that out. Uh, definitely also I need room for all of my books because they were just kind of piled up everywhere in my old room. Um, so the way that I've kind of organized everything, uh, these are all of my German unit histories that I use for death card research. Um, anytime that I'm researching a death card, I'm able to pin a division to, to a, a specific soldier. If I'm able to get a copy of the divisional history for cheap, I add it to the collection because I'm probably going to encounter it again in the future. That being said, the, these books, I think, on average, were like 20 bucks a piece. You know, a lot of them are available on Amazon or similar places. But for a lot of the less famous divisions, they might have had, like, one unit history that was published in, like, the 60s or 70s and then never published again. So if you want to get a copy of that, that's, like, two, yeah. three, four hundred bucks, which is annoying. Um, this is all my document and death card storage in these binders. Uh, photos, documents, death cards. Um, eventually, I'm going to have to switch to a bigger binder for death cards because I've just researched so many over the past year. It's about full now. You know, the, the, some people would call this an addiction. Yeah, that, that's accurate. <laughs> I, I would agree with that. Um, you know it's bad when you would rather buy Militaria than, like, you know, clothes. The good news is uh, death cards, uh, can, typically death cards are affordable yeah, and you, very easy to store. Yes. The downside is we're dealing with a humble collector who decided he is going to own every death card. <laughs> My goal by the time that I retire is 20000 you heard it here, folks. Yeah, that is, that is the goal. Currently, I'm probably sitting somewhere around 1,000, which is pretty good. We're already, like, what, 5% of the way there? Woo! Woo! Yeah. You know, and the reason for that is I did some really scientific, wild-ass guessing, and I think that 20,000 should give me about a 1% sample size of German casualties from... I I, you have fought this first scientifically. So the, the death cards are generally Catholic traditions. What I basically did is I just took the Catholic portion of the German population, applied that to German casualties, ah. added in the Austrians, added a little bit of a factor for cards that probably don't exist and were all destroyed up to this point, and got the 20,000 number. So it's probably horribly wrong, but it, it sounds good, you know? So that's kind of my current goal. Uh, and then when, once I retire, I'll compile everything into a series of books and we'll, we'll go from there yay but uh, that'll give me something to do in my golden years i guess <laughs> um yeah this is the backlog of death cards um it's there to remind me that i have to actually do work um, do work yeah and then as far as like the rest of the book layout everything that's on the shelves here is stuff that i have read through completely so we have like some world war one books here they kind of spread over to this side and then everything else is world war ii um, everything you see piled up like this, I have not had the chance to read yet. So that's like my current reading list backlog. Um, currently, actually grab it from the other room here, uh, Eastern Inferno, which is the oh, yes. journals of a German Panzerjäger on the Eastern Front. What's really neat about these is essentially, uh, the guy who wrote them, uh, can't remember his name, even though I was literally just reading this yesterday, but basically he was writing journals while he was at the front. And when he would go home on leave, he would drop the journals off, get another one. Now, what happened to him is he went missing in early 1944, somewhere in the central portion of the Eastern Front, and was never seen again. I believe it's, uh, his family received, like, an official letter from the Soviet Union or German government, like, 10 years afterwards. Like, yeah, he's probably dead, because we have no record of what happened to him. Uh, but what's interesting is, unlike a lot of the German memoirs that were published post-war, where people were, like, editing their notes and looking back on the memories and everything, this is, like, a raw, unfiltered, I'm here and everything sucks account. So it's very different than a lot of the other ones I've read, which have been pretty cool. Um, and then probably next up on the list here is this mm -hmm, book, yes. The Last of Fall, which is talking about the 1922 exercises in Gettysburg with the uh, U.S. Marine Corps, which is pretty sweet. Yes, uh, long story short, uh, the United States Marine Corps was supposed to be disbanded after World War I. And the high command wanted to prove that, no, this is a, we can use this regularly in peacetime and for future conflicts. So they staged a massive, a massive reenactment of the Battle of Gettysburg, but with 1920s technology. And it was essentially a whole, uh, it was one big showboat for the U.S. Marine Corps to show how powerful they were. Yeah. And it worked. <laughs> and they're still around today. 
But yeah, no, it's just, it's a really neat thing, and it's kind of like a tie to Gettysburg, or Readout and I go over, you know, a couple times a year to World War One, and yeah, there's just some interesting history there, so I'm looking forward to reading more about that. Um, then back in this closet, this is my movie and video game storage currently, and miscellaneous nonsense. Oh, we've got, got chain light, very ominous. Yeah, so this is my Laserdisc, VHS, DVD, Blu-ray uh, collection. I've watched mm, some of these. <laughs> Some of these. Well, some of these, like this giant, like Warbirds of World War II. I haven't watched that. Um, there's the giant, the Civil War from PBS. Yep. I've seen like bits and pieces of it. I don't think I've ever sat down and watched the whole thing through. Sacrilege. Yeah, I know. Um, yeah, eventually, but uh... got interesting. We got the Century of Warfare still in the shrink wrapping, no less. Oh yeah. Yeah, that uh, that came from. I can't remember where I got that. I think I can't remember if that was when my college's library was getting rid of their VHS collection, or if that came from a local store. Or no, did we get that? I can't remember. Um, once you collect enough stuff, you start forgetting where things came from, or you have the thing where you walk in and look at something and be like, "I don't remember when I bought that or where I bought that." It's really cool that I haven't really talked about in any videos I can remember is this uh, Eastern Front um, wool jacket that we have here. This thing is nice and salty, which is the way I usually like my military if it's not a relic condition. And as you can see, it's been patched in a lot of places. Oh, this wow. looks like um, Look at that. Yeah, German uniform standard uh, fabric. But also, there's a really interesting tear and repair here with a very huh. interesting... Now, we just did the forensic stream last night. I did not put this down there because this is very fragile and a very hard-to-get jacket. I didn't want to ruin it in case anything happened. My goal will eventually be to put together a nice, salty, eastern front mannequin. That'd be nice. That's that's going to be pretty far down the priority trail at this well, point. You, you can have the uh, Gaysburg uh, Military Museum. Yeah. Oh, the man, cases. Love, those cases are gorgeous. I love, I love that museum. Um, yeah, I want to eventually do a nice, salty eastern front. I also want to do a Volkstorm eventually, because I have the Panzerfaust, I have a Volkstorm armband, and really all I need technically to throw that uniform together now is like an old like civilian... like. French coat and, and then you can um, screenshot the sequence from uh, World at War. The yep. old, the weak, the young. Yep. Victor Reznov. What a man. Yeah, tr true hero. Indeed. Hero of the Soviet Union. Yes, played by an Englishman. Well, yeah, that's usually how, how yeah. things work. <laughs> um, so one thing that we really haven't shown on, on camera before, we referenced on the stream last night, I think we referenced a few, few videos. This is the Ukraine collection currently. Uh, everything that you're seeing here has been captured in Ukraine over the past year and a half now. Um, minus, of course, the Ukrainian items, which weren't captured. But, yeah, there's a good mix of stuff here. There's uniform pieces, there's medals, there's patches, there's equipment. Um, I've basically been tracking the process, the progress of the war daily. Um, you know, it's definitely something that's absorbed a lot of my life over the past year. I've made a lot of good contacts on the ground in Ukraine, and I've been buying far more than I should have. I would have bought AC months ago if it had not been for the, uh, the collecting of this stuff. But it's really interesting, the dichotomy between the Ukraine collecting and like the World War One and the World War Two, because with the World War One, World War Two collecting, you know, we have all of this decades of collecting experience and knowledge and reference books and forums. And with Ukraine, it's currently still happening, but also like the supply chain situations changed where like Russian soldiers are buying equipment off AliExpress, which is the same place that people selling the fake stuff are getting their things from. So if they're both getting it from the same seller, it's the same equipment. The only difference is one is used in the field, one isn't. So that I, I'm kind of concerned for the future of the collecting hobby. I think in the future people are just going to have to be accept that it's the right equipment to have been used, but there's no way to tell because it was also sold on the civilian yeah, market. Yeah, and I think in a large sense, that's what we ultimately aim at as historians. Yeah. To, to, to tell the story. It's like, this is what these soldiers were using. Yeah. As long as we can, and it can say it was also made at the same time. Yeah, it made just, at the same time, same manufacturers. But, don't get us wrong. We love the added bonus of the stories. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the stories are always really interesting. Um, but yeah, I will say, so these, these helmets here, I'm fairly certain that the Ukrainian soldiers who sold these actually added a lot of this stuff. So, does that make it fake or does that make it trench art? That that's a good point. Yeah. So this is kind of like a weird situation where you also have soldiers on the front line that are using social media to sell items to raise money for equipment. So if a soldier in a trench, you know, throws a Z on a helmet to sell to raise money for equipment, that's still military, even though it's also kind of fake, but it's still real. 
mind blown. It's very confusing. What? Yeah. So it's gonna be an interesting war to see when the first reference books come out in now, like a decade. I'll say probably my favorite items that you've brought from Ukraine, and it's so fascinating to see. I guess what the dichotomy is of both sides. Yeah. Dich- dichotomy is that the right word? The the yeah. the. The, the duality, duality. Yeah. yeah, the flags. Yeah, the so flags. we got several flags here. Yeah, so I'll start off. This is a um, Ukrainian flag in the back here. That was from Sumi, I think. But that that was being used by one of the um, partisan groups there. Got that a while ago. Um, also, this is a really nice flag. This is the like the nicest official Russian flag that I have here. This is the flag of the Russian ground forces. Um, this particular example was pulled out of a hotel in Kherson after the um, Russians withdrew. And basically what happened was there was a hotel there that Russian officers were using that the Ukrainians hit with a missile. And apparently after the city was liberated, this was found in the building. So obviously given the condition, it wasn't where the missile hit. But um, this is super high quality compared to a lot of the other ones that you see available that are literally from AliExpress probably. This is from Kherson, right? Yeah, Kherson. Okay. Had to make sure I was correct there. Yes, and um, also note that all of the items here are tagged because Ahambo Collector is a top-notch historian, that archivist. He makes sure that he has all the history labeled down the moment he receives a marks down, unlike the person holding the camera, who has not is too scared to delve into what he has purchased and is now sitting in piles and may or may not be rotting. It, it, it's hard because basically if you're not tagging stuff as it's coming in, it's so daunting to sit down and be like, oh gosh, I have hundreds of items that I now have to go through my emails, my text messages, my auction descriptions, and figure out and piece together a story. Like that was really the best part of lockdown from COVID is I finally caught up on archiving my collection, my World War I, World War II stuff. I've since let it get away from me a little bit. There's items like the jacket and um, a couple other small things I haven't tagged yet. Um, but yeah, with the Ukraine stuff, I've been pretty good about tagging it as it's come in, um, just for the sake of conservation. Uh, moving on to the other flags here, we have two uh, supposed DPR flags here, one hanging on the back of the shelf, and then this one here. Now, a lot of these separatist groups use a lot of Soviet iconography in their stuff. Uh, this is also just an old Soviet flag that's been dressed up. Now, once again, I, I'm going to caveat this by saying I have no idea if these inscriptions are from the separatist forces or if you, the Ukrainian soldiers captured this flag and then added this stuff to make it more appealing to people to buy. I, I'm going to caveat that by saying I don't know. And, and again, it's almost to the point where does it doesn't matter at this point. But I think it does, personally. I'd like to know either way. But, you know, going back to that whole telling stories and, you know, what's real, what isn't, it's kind of interesting. Um, and then one flag that actually just came in, it's a bit spicy, um, I'll clean that up later, <laughs> um, yeah, this flag right here just came in Thursday, um, so this is oh. a flag for oh, yeah. uh, Rus- Rusish group, so uh, if you're not familiar with the name, Rusish became instantly famous on the internet because they released a video where they decapitated a Ukrainian POW on camera and then posted it. Um, so they're very small, like private military contract group. I think they're about a thousand people. And basically what happened and the reason that I got this and the two medals that came with it is apparently somebody was going out to the field with some stuff for them. And because the Russians don't have access to GPS anymore, because the GPS satellites are owned by France and the U S mostly, uh, he took a wrong turn and got captured by Ukrainian forces. And when they searched his car, they found a bag, and in the bag was a bunch of Rusish flags and medals. Um, so he's a POW now, as you'll have happen to you. But currently, if I'm remembering correctly from what the seller told me, in the bag they found like four of these medals, and I think like a dozen of these medals. So these were met for Rusish group out in the field. As far as I'm aware, these are the only ones on the collecting market, or the ones from that haul. And these actually just came in this past week, which is nice. So this was... We believe, because there's no documentary evidence with it, this is for uh, drone operators. You'll notice the body of the drone there is like an old Slavic, like medieval helmet. And of course we have the Volksnote there, which is an old... Uh, it's one of those old pagan symbols that then like the, the neo-Nazis kind of took. And there, there's a lot of weird like Nazi iconography yeah. in the war in Ukraine. 
We yeah, live, well, yeah. We live in a strange time. Yeah, we got people using the Sickle and Hammer. We got people using the Swastika. It's, it's... It, it is. It is bizarre. I... I, I don't know what to compare it to historically, if I'm being honest with you. I mean, I, I've sometimes coined it the first war fueled by memes. It really is, to an extent. Um, and that, that's a whole other subject for another day about the power of the meme. Yeah, we might have to do a video on that at some point. So this is the other medal, um, St. George's Ribbon on here, which is another big Russian symbol from this war, and all these runes. This medal, we're not really sure what it was supposed to be awarded for. Somebody said that uh, Wagner, which is another big PMC group, probably the biggest one that you see in the news all the time, uh, they have a similar design medal that's used for, like, soldiers that are wounded. So it could be, like, a, a wound medal. Um, but who knows? We're not going to know until somebody publishes a book on it at some point or, you know, more information surfaces. But this is literally, like, these were captured less than a month ago, and now they're sitting on my shelf, which is the other crazy thing from this war. Um, is, you know, every other item in my collection has taken 80 to 100 plus years to get here. You know, it's passed through who knows how many hands... Um, to get to the point that it's now sitting on my shelves. And this stuff, it's, it's literally sometimes a month from the time it's captured to the time it ends up here. And that's just really mind-boggling to me. Um, yeah, so eventually what's probably going to happen is once the, the war in Ukraine kind of ends, I'm going to... Please end sooner than later. Yes, please. Please just end. Um, I'm probably going to keep out a couple things from Ukraine. The rest of it I'm probably going to bag and tag and put in storage. Because the ultimate goal eventually be to have get back to World War One and World War Two, which is what I like to focus on. Get another shelf put in here for World War Two stuff. Um, have this wall space free to hang some more stuff up. That's the ultimate goal. So a lot of this stuff I'll put in storage for the next 20, 30, 40 years. <laughs> and then, you know, at that point, maybe somebody will be interested in it who's putting together a reference book or something. Or hopefully a museum. Or a museum of some kind. That'd be, uh, that'd be pretty cool. Would you say is the most iconic item you have in your collection, minus death cards. Okay, minus death cards. A, a, a physical artifact you have. What has become the most iconic artifact for your collection? Ooh, the most iconic artifact for my collection. Probably. I mean, if we're talking about iconic, you can't get any more iconic than the 28th Division helmet. I mean, that's my, uh, my channel emblem on my uh, user profile. This was actually one of the first World War One pieces that I bought with my... Uh, or that I bought back when I really started collecting. Um, actually, it is item number one in the collection oh, wow. inventory. Uh, even though I had a few other items I got before it. World War One Twenty Eighth Division helmet. Liner is basically gone. Um, I guess what one thing I'll note here, because I see this on the online forum a lot, is yes, certain World War One helmets have asbestos liners. And as soon as people hear that, because we're all inundated with the mesothelioma commercials every day, um, <laughs> is, oh my gosh, there's asbestos in my helmet. I'm going to die. What do I do? How do I get the pad out of there? Well, here's the thing with asbestos. It's only dangerous if you breathe it in. So literally the worst thing you can do is try to rip the asbestos liner out of a helmet because it's going to get airborne and you're going to breathe it in. It's a problem. If it's just sitting here, it is 100% safe. Um, so that, that's my PSA there for that. Uh, but yeah, that's probably like the most iconic piece of my helmet. Probably paired with the bayonet that's also in there. Um, i trying to think. What other stuff that I'm kind of known for is obviously like the Battlefield Relics. Um, so as far as like the relic items, though, I've got a few that I'm really proud of. Uh, the Dushka Shield that we um, just did a video oh, on yeah. back in Military in March. That's pretty cool. Um, probably one of my favorite relics is, of course, the D-Day Canteen. So this is a British canteen that was dug up in a garden in... Uh, what, Bernier-sur-Mer, or Bernier-by-the-Sea, and still has water in it from D-Day, which is pretty freaking cool. Uh, I think the British canteens are actually lined with porcelain, so the odds of this actually, like, rusting through at any point are, like, nil, but I still have it in this half a milk jug in case it does ever break. Just one day. Just one day, just, yeah, yeah the Johnstown flood in the, in, the in the artifact room. Yeah, that'd be bad. That'd be pretty bad. Um, well, probably the other item that people, when they walk into a room, one of the first things everybody gravitates for is the Panzerfaust. Probably one of the better buys I've ever had. I love this piece. I mean, as far as, like, late war German weapons go, you can't get more iconic than the Panzerfaust. It's got maybe, like, a Stormgewehr rifle. Um, you know, shape charge, first, like, you know, one-time use, then you throw out the tube, like, anti-tank weapon, which becomes a standard later on in the century. Uh, this is the 60 millimeter version, which is like the standard issue. They made literally millions of these during the war. 
And this one's lovely because it's all original, to the best of my knowledge. Original paint, original tube, uh, d milled original warhead with the original instruction label on it. You'd be hard-pressed to get, like, more original than this. This is a very nice piece. I'm very happy with it. Um, it just feels good to hold it, too. And like I said, one day, eventually, I'm going to put together a, uh, a Volk Spoon display. Or not, yeah. No, not Volk Volkstrom. Spoon. Vol Volkstrom. Thank you. Oh, Volkstrom. Vol Volk Spoon's the group that maintains all the military cemeteries. That's different. Yeah, Volkstrom. Very, very different. <laughs> yeah, very different thing. Um, and this will be part of that uh, when I put it together. And then, yeah, really cool because the way they demilled it, you can see the, uh, the shape charge which is what gave this the uh, punching power to get through that Soviet armor. Now, they made multiple versions of the Panzerfaust. They had the 60, uh, they had the 30, which is the Panzerfaust Klein, which is a smaller model. Uh, they had, what, there was like a Panzerfaust 90, and then there's another one that's in between 90 and 150. I can't remember if it's 100 or it's 120. Uh, but then I also have the tube here for a Panzerfaust 150. Uh, according to the seller, uh, the only difference I've been able to find between this tube and this tube is that this screw is down here instead of up here. And every photo that I've referenced from every other model of Panzerfaust, the screw's here. And the 150 was made super late in the war. Very few of them ever actually made it to the front line because German logistics in 1945 basically just didn't exist. What's logistics? Yeah, what is logistics? Um, and this was actually recovered from a lake north of Berlin. They found a whole bunch of Panzerfausts that were just thrown in this lake. They're just the trying to get rid of them, just dumped them. And... Yeah, pretty much. That's why... Be careful when you're out in the woods and lakes of Europe because they're just full of explosives, if the internet has taught me anything. Um, Actually, most of the world is just covered in explosives right now. It, it really is, to an extent. Uh, how many uh, broken arrow incidents? A lot. Yeah. Far, far more than is acceptable. Yeah, one occurred only like an hour from here back in the 60s. Yeah. We need to do a video on that someday. Yeah, we do. That's we just need cool. we need to have foilage. We need, we, need tree, we need limbs and grass... We need leaves down. I'm talking about limbs and grass. Wow. Uh, I, you know, you know, when it gets to that time today, folks, and you start it's, jumbling words. It's Sunday. We were up late last night. Very late. Watching movies and YouTube. And, and, and we'll probably continue. Drinking probably more than we should have. But, yeah. And so it's all part of the thing. So with that out of the way, uh, pizza time. Yeah, pizza time.